Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Level Up podcast, where we talk to some of the brightest engineering and product leaders about what it takes to build great products, teams, and companies. Today, I'm here with Brandon Chu, VP of Product Acceleration at Shopify. Shopify is an e-commerce platform powering the online and brick and mortar stores of millions of merchants. Brandon began years ago as a co-founder at Toonzy, worked for a brief time at FreshBooks, and then had a momentous career arc at Shopify. And today we're gonna be chatting with Brandon about that journey and uh, his observations around product teams and product management. Um, So Brandon, why don't we start with just telling us a little bit about yourself. Like again, you've had this incredible arc, uh, again, professional poker player, founder, product manager, VP. Um, Can you give us a, a bit of a tour of that background? Amazing. Well, first off, thanks for having me, Ken. Um, it's been for those of you that don't know, Ken and I worked together at Shopify for a while. I'm also an angel investor in Ken's company, so tons of respect for for what you do. And thanks for having me on. Um, I'll give the I've done this like a, a bunch of times. So I'll give like you know the abbreviated and, and short version of it. I think like when I reflect back on on my career, it, it actually does it actually does start with poker. I used to play poker like in the lunchroom uh, it, when I was in in early high school. This is the era when like poker was becoming popular again in the U.S. When Chris Moneymaker just like this Joe Schmo off the street won the World Series, and all of a sudden everyone thought it's super easy, and then it got really 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 popular and so you know uh i was playing literally playing for quarters and stuff like that in the lunchroom um we figured out how to that was also the time when like online poker was starting up uh soon thereafter and we figured out how to get some money online even though we didn't have credit cards we literally put cash into an envelope sent it to the bahamas and they credited our account uh, i say our because like my friends and i and we, we shared it and uh you know so i i say that that's the start of it because uh poker actually has been like uh, a really big part of the way I make decisions and sort of like how I've like honed in my psychology around around tough moments decisions and like thinking long term which I'll, I'll touch on um, kind of as we go but um, so from there I, I actually grew up in the era where people still wanted to work on Wall Street uh, so I went into university for finance and and derivatives and capital markets and stuff like that um, I, I graduated and was in like a co-op program and internships, so I actually uh, took a full-time job at one of the companies I was working at, which was Kraft Foods, which is kind of a strange place. But basically what I did there was work on uh, models and forecasting for figuring out commodities prices. Uh, so basically, you know, how many Oreos would North American consumers eat in the next quarter? You know, how many hundreds of millions of dollars of sugar and wheat do we need to buy for input costs? And how do we, like, hedge that with futures markets and stuff like that? So, so You're you know, making sure KD is available, you know, for the broad market. Uh, more so on making sure that we always make our money at the end of the day. Fair enough. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I lived in Excel basically for about three and a half years. And uh, eventually I, I sort of um, got a little uh, a little worried that like, oh, the rest of my, I almost had like a quarter life crisis basically, uh, where, you know, in, in that world, careers are very structured. You do one year in this role and two years in that role, you go to this level, that level, and it goes on and on for like 30, 40 years. And so I think I got spooked by that, just that thought of it. And cause I've always been, you know, somewhat entrepreneurial and just had a lot of side businesses and stuff in high school. And so I started, uh, bootstrapping something on the side with an ex classmate of mine. Um, and sorry, you might hear some banging. There's a, my, my uh, infant son is outside. Anyway, um, and uh, we started to actually just work together kind of um, after work on what became a product called Toonzy, which we, we co-founded as a startup. Uh, and basically, it's a very long story, but we're first-time entrepreneurs. Neither of us knew how to code. Uh, we somehow were decent at pitching, so we were able to raise some like like angel uh, capital, and we kind of flash quit our jobs with like no product and a PowerPoint deck. Um, somehow able to raise like 300 grand or something like that, just based on, I guess, like sheer will and uh you know for three and a half years we just like went through every single failure possible um i became way more technical i kind of learned how to code on the front end and i ended up naturally gravitating towards working with the designers and engineers that that we hired and you know we raised a bunch of rounds it kind of went up and then flat and then kind of very very gently up so much that it was not really a venture venture backable business and we, we ended up selling it um to this company called sfx entertainment uh that's a whole long story that i'm just literally going to skip uh but you know from there i think that experience really a like 
showed me the world of tech. It also did something really important for me psychologically, which is like uh, post-graduation from university, I learned that you can learn completely new things and be quite good at them. And so like building the confidence of like, oh, wow, like I literally didn't know what HTML was. And, you know, by the end of three and a half years, I was able to, to write some, some decent front end code here and there. Uh, no, nothing ever too complicated, but enough that like I demystified the web in a way. And uh, that, that was really important, I think, for me because it, it allowed me to, to just have confidence to, you know, uh, always learn new things and kind of go headfirst into anything. And the more unknown it is, sort of the richer the outcome is going to be. And um, anyway, so from there, I I uh, thought about what to do next and kind of through that entrepreneurial experience in the Toronto ecosystem, which is pretty small for startups, at least back then, uh, I had met uh, the founder of FreshBooks and sort of in speaking um, with him and thinking about what's next, kind of put on the table like, hey, why don't you be a PM here? And uh, because what you've been doing as a founder is basically what a PM does. I didn't even know what that role was. Uh, so I joined the company. It was a really amazing experience. Like FreshBooks is a great company. It's, it, it, had, it hadn't even raised like a series... B, I think at that time it was maybe 80 people. So really small. And, um, but it did, uh, within its product management team, there's only like a couple people, but they were all like ex Microsoft and, uh, like over a decade and a half there. So what was interesting about that is by joining that company and that organization, I kind of learned like almost the other end of the spectrum of like super framework process, heavy product management. And I had to marry that with my own chaotic experience of being a founder and just like, you know, being in the weeds with engineers and designers and making thousands of decisions, um, you know, in a year. Yeah. on the fly. And so, you know, I stayed at FreshBooks for about three and a half years. Amazing experience. We raised Series B. We grew the company to like, I think, two, 250 or 300 people. Uh, I grew my career there, became a director or whatnot. And I think the the sort of midpoint of it all was like I was able to marry those two experiences into this sort of, you know, have an entrepreneurial spirit and know like that motivating a team is not unlike a founder motivates their team within a PM within like a product group. Uh, and, but then at the same time, like you're growing company and you need systems. So thinking about frameworks, thinking about culture and the way that it reinforces better product decisions as the company scales, um, you know, balance those two things. So that's kind of what was so formative about, about fresh books. And, uh, I was thinking about what's next. I had a job offer in hand at some other company in Toronto for like some header product job. And, I um, wanted to talk to his name is Satish Kanwar. He's still a VP of product at Shopify, and his agency Jack Cooper had been acquired by Shopify. And I was asking him, "Hey, like, uh, should I join this company?" Because they had done some work for them. And basically, like, he's pretty masterful at this stuff. So he just turned it around. And basically, said, "Like, you don't want to join those clowns, and why don't you come join Shopify?" Uh, and you know, I, I at first I just like, oh, I can't do that. It's like it's they, you know, they were about to IPO. It was way too too late. Um, you know, I'd just be like a cog, a cog in the machine. And, uh, he convinced me at least to take some meetings. Um, I ended up meeting Toby as part of that. And, um, you know, he really convinced me that it was, it was day one in his mind and that, you know, that this was not just some Canadian tech company, but it is truly, um, a company that has the ambition to be a global tech company. And, um, obviously in retrospect that turned out to be true. Uh, not that it was, you know, uh, a given by at that point. And so, uh, I took a triple demotion and joined the company as just a PM one. Um, and, uh, I found out after that one of the reasons Toby had, uh, interviewed me was because, uh, they didn't really have a product organization actually. Like, um, Toby had been pretty adamant for a long time. There were about 500 people at the time, this 2015, and they'd been pretty adamant, uh, you know, that we didn't want this, this function that doesn't build. Uh, we don't need that. Like engineers and designers and everyone really support folk. Everyone is a product thinker. There's no special group that does product thinking. And so, uh, you know, it was, I think with a little bit of hesitation that he was willing to hire people that would purely do this kind of like, you know, abstract function. And that's, uh, and, the, and so there wasn't really an org when I joined, there was maybe like three or four people in the whole company with the word product in their title. And they were all doing random stuff. Like some people were, 
were just like basically operations or GMs of certain parts of the business or something like that. They're just like the name they got, they got a product uh, title in their name because they didn't know what else to give them. So I say all that because uh, the first, I'd characterize like the first uh, three years of my career at Shopify really was um, aligning with the exec team and building up the product management culture and organization, figuring out what the principles should be um, for that, and and then uh, hiring and scaling, you know, the right people to fit that type of thing. And we could talk about that uh, after I uh, finish the arc, uh, unless you want to just go into it now. What do you want? <laughs> I kind of I'd love to pull on that actually because yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, when I joined Shopify, it was 2017, and there definitely was that sentiment like everybody is a product person, um, even still, but. I'd love to understand how you started to shape that, like for other leaders that are out there, how can they start thinking about like bringing product principles, you know, when either there is that at the edge or where it's sort of this nebulous definition of what it means to be a product manager? Yeah. Well, maybe I'll share a story. Like my, my literal first project at the company was, um, uh, showing up, uh, to with the team on like some Monday, just joining the meeting that they had because I found out that they had their, I guess it was sprint planning or something that day. I don't even know if it was formally that. And then like, you know, very direct culture, very just like straight, uh, um, uh, kind of like a, uh, a straight up culture. And just like, so like, why are you here? What do you do? Just like blank, blank face. And, and it's actually pretty damn hard to explain. It's so like if it's a you know if it's a bunch of engineers and designers who've never worked the PM like it is actually really confusing why this person is here, and and so you know m- you know my answer at the time was sort of like, hey I'm here to like like we're building something that has a lot of dependencies across other teams and like the way that we go to market uh, is going to make a difference in terms of how uh, it's going to be you know received and ultimately used and 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 finally like I'm here to focus on the customer like the, the who we're building for and making sure that like we're getting the fastest feedback loops pass possible to make the right decisions and so they're like okay well I guess like just sit in the meeting or whatever and so you know, that was like, I, I say that because that was the, you know, what you're walking into as a PM. And then the other thing is like, uh, there might've been, you know, 500 people, let's call it 30, 40 projects going on. Right. Uh, but there's only, as I mentioned, like three or four people with product in their title and even probably only me and one other person were actually acting as PMs. So like no one had a PM on their team. So there's no like pattern, Right. It's just like, yo, like, why are we the random team that has this random person <laughs> kind of thing? And so, you know, uh, that's a tricky situation to walk into. And basically where my mind went at that point, it's like, okay, like the only way to, to, um, be useful is to be useful. And so I'm going to find out, I'm just going to listen. I'm going to do anything I can do, whether, you know, I didn't actually do this, but like the, the cliche is like, I'll take out the trash or whatever it is, right? I'll do anything I can to just help this team move faster. And like in small, hun- literally hundreds of small ways, I, hu- I help them move faster, whether it's managing the backlog, I'll do the notes, I'll, I'll, I'll communicate with, you know, Toby or whoever. And like just doing the PM thing of like handling the stakeholder management, keeping everyone organized, keeping everyone focused on, on the goal, keeping everyone like being that kind of almost objective person in a sprint planning or decision or technical or design decision to say like, well, what's the best thing for the customer here? Or how do we make a trade off between that effort and the output and all like just being that sounding board and that d- discussion facilitator. So, you know, doing that day in, day out, people start to really recognize that, oh, it is like, I don't know how to explain it in one, like one specific thing, like, oh, like as simple as he codes, uh, but this person makes our team better. And the other thing was that um, really quickly, like PMs generally are, are, are good communicators and we were able to like advocate for what that team was doing more broadly in the company. And so the other thing that happened was the teams that PMs that had PMs, they tended to just like be more aligned and have more support from like the exec team and Toby and like everyone knew what they were doing. And so there's like a little bit of like, you know, there's a bit of cheerleading happening and like a little bit of popularity that falls on that team because they literally have someone whose job it is to keep 
uh, communicating what the team is doing, keeping everyone updated and excited about what's happening. And so, you know, it, it was all those types of things that as we started to grow the organization, um, we just started to get to a place where, and our actual goal as a group in the first six months was, or in the first year was at the end of the year, we want engineers to come and ask for PMs. That was that was the litmus test. If they do that, then we know that reputationally, you know, we're we're good and that we're actually creating value. And so that actually happened within six months. Nice. So it sounds like you you had a goal that was in mind of like in, increasing the uh, the number of teams that wanted to ask for PMs, and the way to get there is just by building trust with the teams and again doing whatever you could do, but also cheerleading for those teams and uh, and getting them better recognition from the executive. Yeah, absolutely. And it's weird. Like it's, you can't come in and say like, Oh, I'm coming in. I think the output of it all is like when you have a a really good PM on your team, you're going to make more precise, better decisions that are uh, well supported and meet the customer need way, way more uh, often. It's very hard for you to walk in and say that you're going to do that. Right. A, it's a little bit insulting. Uh, B it's like, it's pretty abstract. Like how the hell are you going to do that? Uh, and it also takes a very long time for that to be validated. So you kind of just have to walk the walk and then you can figure out how to talk later. I think a big part of it also is like being a PM, it's a full-time job, right? Like to, to be able to understand what the customer requirements are, to be able to do that true leading, like, and when it, that responsibility is diffused on a team in the case of Shopify pre PM where it's engineers and us, you can spread that load, but you lose that concentration, you lose that focus, right? Uh, and I've seen, I've seen this play out at big companies and small. This is more on the engineering side. An engineer is saying like, okay, I did this thing. Like, why don't I get recognition for that? Like, why doesn't the executive care about what I'm working on? It's like, because they don't know about it. Like, they have a million things going on in their world. Like, are you advocating for that? Are you, you know, you're doing things. Are you telling people? Uh, so I 100% agree with that role of like product to be, be that champion for the teams, be that advocate and, and you know, get that buy-in. Yeah. And the key is like, you don't want even the PM's job to be like, let's make this team really popular. Right. It just has to be some amazing out, extra positive outcome of the actual work, which is like communicating and aligning because, you know, especially when you're building infrastructure stuff, you need to be like front and center in everyone's mind about like how, like what is going to change when it's going to change, how other teams can use it, et cetera. Like it's, it's, that's the value in aligning everyone towards, you know, a more highly dependent roadmap. And then that kind of extra second order effect is that, you know, you get a little bit more uh, sunshine on your team. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to hear more about get back to the career arc again, like as yeah, you kind of advanced sure. there as a, uh, <laughs> And so, yeah, you know, shop, I had IPO started growing like crazy. We we're growing at the time, like 150, 160% year over year, nonstop. And, uh, people were just falling from the sky. Like every two weeks, 20, like when I joined the Toronto office, it was maybe like 40 people. Ottawa was about maybe five, 600. And, uh, within two weeks, like, sorry, within like six months, like every two weeks, 25 people would just join the company. And we were just hiring like crazy. And to be honest, we didn't even know what these people would do. So like my job very quickly became like, uh, a, like think some really long-term strategy, um, so that a lot of teams, even without, you know, very structured management around them can sort of like, uh, sort of align themselves around loosely, <laughs> right? Like, you know, we're trying to do this general thing in this area, you and your team start building stuff that helps that goal, et cetera. And then, you know, just like literally just taking nonstop coffee meetings, breakfast meetings with people, like welcoming them to Shopify and, and joining. So anyway, that's like the first three years. Uh, I rose the ranks, eventually became like a product director. And then as a company, we started to go through sort of our first big, at least in my tenure there, big organizational change, which was we decided to move from a functional structure, you know, where like all engineers roll up eventually to CTO to a divisional structure, which we called product lines. And uh, that was really for a few reasons. One, it was like in order to scale. So could give an example as a product line, like there'd be a payments group there'd be like a shipping group there'd be a group on the core product and uh then there there would be a group on what we call the platform or our ecosystem our third party ecosystem developer uh developer products and apis so that that was my group and so you know the reason we did that as a company was really in order to allow scale also had the effect of like um uh 
enabling like another set of leaders to develop and emerge because uh, what happened when I got tapped for that role was that I was no longer like just a product person. I became what they called a GM and I had like engineering report into me and design and like all, all these other functions. And so it was much more of like kind of like a like a mini CEO within a larger company kind of thing. And um, and so that was like an amazing experience for me. That's when you and I wor- started working together. Um, you know, when we formed that that little product line, what we which we call platform, was well, whatever twenty five people, and like I think we had like three engineers. So it was like it was almost like a bet to say uh, that platform matters as a company. And I'll actually pause here and just explain that. Like people take for granted Shopify's platform today, the tens of thousands of developers and apps, and like the fact that you know it's hard to even separate using Shopify's core product versus the apps in the ecosystem as a way to like make commerce uh, better than ever, just like it's in- inseparable using your iPhone and using apps on it, right? And that's taken for granted today, but back then it was actually like not really thought of as like a strategic moat for the company or something really core. It was much more of like, you know, Shopify, the product that you log into and all the things, the features that we build are the things that matter and then, or, or is used by most people. And then after that, uh, you can, you know, add a few things. But what we saw in the data was that um, when you looked at the distribution, mer- merchants increasingly were using more and more apps, and there was almost no cases of actual really productive merchants that were using no apps, and they also weren't using all the same apps. Like the distribution of like uh, of, of of like the different types of vertical specific or stage specific apps that they're using, jurisdictional uh, differences, stuff like that. It was really really like snowflakey everywhere, and that's because the reality is every business is unique in some way. And so uh, we, we quickly brought that data up to Toby and really had a big debate around like, hey, like this I think is actually the fundamental way to scale uh, to become a global company. There's zero percent chance we're going to be able to build everything that we need to to like, you know, give some crazy, uh, not even crazy, but just random examples like GDPR compliance in Europe when that was happening, right? Like uh, for us to like get ahead of that and build that into our core fee- pro- product, A, it's a lot of work. B, how much, what do we have to stop in order to do that? And will we actually be fast enough? And like, that's a place where regulatory changes were happening real time. Right, so it's like we we have to are we even like in tune enough with what's happening on the ground in Europe to do that well, and the answer is to no no for all of those things right. And so um, before we even thought about GDPR, there were already. GDPR apps on the ecosystem because there are developers in Europe saying like, oh, this is coming like next month and I know what it means, you know, I know what it means in France. And so I'm going to build this app for French merchants. And like, think of the cognitive and strategic uh, overhead that is now gone from the company because these third party developers are doing that organically. Right. And, and think about the precision and, and what's actually being built that would take our company like a year of research to do. Uh, multiply that by every country, every industry, you know, and now you get to the idea of like why this is actually the the only way to scale. And so like that was really the big pitch and why uh, we were kind of seated as a, a division. Um, so we quickly grew, as you know, you were here during this time, which is crazy. We were hiring like crazy. Like we grew from 25 to like 250, 270 people in like 18 months. Um, literally like not enough chairs and desks. And uh, it was, we stepped up really quickly and we actually had to figure out also like what it meant to be a product organization around a platform uh, or, or, or around this concept of platform um, that was emerging. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, uh, first of all, you're absolutely right. Like, the, there's this massive long tail of functionality that any company, Shopify included, couldn't meet by itself. And it, the, the, the strategy of adopting third parties to help, you know, fill those gaps makes a ton of sense. I was wondering, you know, can you talk a little bit about part of that strategy? You've talked in the past about this idea of a flywheel effect. I was wondering if you could just elaborate a bit on that and what that means. Sure. Um, basically, the flywheel is it starts with Shopify aggregates a bunch of merchants. So we build a great 
you know, call it a single player product uh, where a merchant can build their own store, launch a website, et cetera. So we, we do that really well for the first 10 years of the company. We start to get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of merchants. We open up a bunch of APIs um, in certain areas and we sort of let the creativity of the ecosystem, which didn't exist, but then we tell developers, hey, you can build some stuff for these merchants and you can sell directly to them. Uh, we are aggregating them and you only have to build on Shopify in order to build a successful business. So that's a hard pitch at the beginning when you're small, but when you get more merchants, now it becomes more attractive economically for these developers. So then people start building things like as simple as a widget that helps you embed Instagram on your homepage. Or literally there was an app that made millions of dollars and all it did was add a free shipping banner at the top of the page. Like you'd install it and then a merchant who, again, these are not technical merchants. These are not technical people. So they install this thing and now they have a free shipping anywhere in the continental US banner like at the top of their website and they'll, they will, and that helps so much on sales that they're going to pay like $9 a month for it. <laughs> right. So like there's these like hobbyist small developers that are like, Holy crap, this is like a gold mine. And they start building every little thing under the sun. And what happens in aggregate, right? So hundreds of developers do that. Now, um, merchants are looking at Shopify and it's like, whoa, like Shopify out of the box plus all these apps is actually like even crazier a value proposition now. Like I can really make anything happen and it grows the market, the addressable market of merchants that can use Shopify. Therefore, we aggregate more merchants and then there are more developers and then the flywheel right. just keeps spinning. That's yeah. awesome. Um, you also talked about part of the scaling challenges of this new, what was new platform group from 25 people to 280. How did you think about structuring and aligning teams around platform principles? Oh, well, I think the first thing that was even to figure out what platform principles would be here, like just give everyone context, like the app platform was really just a set of rest APIs and a directory, which basically allowed a, a merchant to give access to an individual developer, uh, give access to their store uh, to make REST calls to their store. We had some ability to like Im Im like embed an app inside of Shopify's admin, which is really just um, embedding their website, like iframe, embedding yeah. an iframe into the into the admin, which is like you know really janky, frankly. And like you know at least back then we figured out a lot of things to make it more secure, but like less secure back then. And and so that's kind of what it was, um, but still very active, right? Just because of how many merchants we're aggregating, it was such a huge opportunity. So you know the first thing is to think about like okay, what what is the surface area of the platform that we care about? And then how do we develop principles around there that everyone can build against? And so like um, the way the mental model that I really worked on, you know, this will be very repetitive to you, Ken, because I literally said it like every day for like three years. But it's just like thinking through like the supply and demand of the platform. So thinking through from an economics perspective, you know, there's a supply and demand aspect of um, merchants that are on Shopify as the supply side. Right. And uh, uh, and it's supplies because like those are the businesses you can serve. And then they all and then uh, that creates demand from developers wanting to make money and and build apps for themselves. And so the better we can actually like um, uh, basically segment those merchants and allow developers to know what areas to build into the better. So, right. So if we know, Hey, there's a huge growth in, in German merchants, but we have a low supply of apps in the, in the app store for there, then we need to be able to generate developer demand, uh, uh, to build in that area. Right. So we can do things like we can create, promotional campaigns to say like, Hey, if you build, you know, special apps for just for German merchants and translate them or whatever, you know, you'll, you get whatever, no, no developer fee for the first year or whatever, blah, 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 we'll run competitions, et cetera. So like there was this, that, that was one mental model of like how we're going to manage this thing. The second side, much more technical is like product principles around what we actually want the end state of the product to be. And like, you know, we wanted to move from janky iframe based apps towards something that's actually like feels native and embedded in, into Shopify's admin. And so it doesn't, 
and, and or, or like get rid of more like jumping around to like 18 browser tabs because each one is a different app and then somehow in the back end all the data syncs right because um, that's that happened a lot as well and so you know we started to build a lot of infrastructure, both back end and front end, uh, towards what we call these app extensions. And uh, extensions were basically like uh, much more structured ways for a third party app to inject value into Shopify uh, and to actually have the merchant interact with that app through what could be native UI or in some cases no UI at all. Uh, so for example, like if we know that there's a set of apps that let's say, you know, uh, I'll just make something up. There's a set of apps. I'll use a current example. So say like you wanted AI GPT three to like write copy, uh, on, on, uh, on your website. So on the description page where merchants write in this website, uh, what would happen in the past was you'd have to launch this GPT three fake app that I'm making up and you'd generate it there and you'd copy paste it and you'd put it into Shopify. Right. Um, so right away you're like, two things ha are happening. One is so that's really janky. Two, yeah. the GPT-3 app actually has to create a UI mm -hmm. so that people can do that. Right. And then secondly, like how many merchants get lost in that dance? Yeah. Especially can't the UI, you can imagine, is, is different among different apps, right? There's totally. no consistency in terms of like branding or style. Totally. Now, here's an app extension way to tackle that product problem. On the product description page, what if there was a button or a dropdown that allowed you to access apps that are relevant to that page. And if you hit, you know, some drop down, it says generate description. Generate description. Yeah. Yeah. Immediately makes a call in the back end uh, to uh, to GPT three fake app, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> who has to re who who knows exactly what's in that call, and in the call would be like let's say a payload of the the title of the product, maybe some imagery or whatever it, the the thing would need to actually generate some useful copy, and then it knows it needs to return that copy, and then it automatically just puts it right into the page. And this could this could even all happen like client side in some cases, right? Uh, and so, you know that like that is an amazing experience that is literally like ten times faster, ten times less confusing, and other other benefits like it would natively work across different uh, devices. So that would work on uh, you know the browser uh, on your desktop. It could also work in the native app using the same backend or, or the same extension code. And so like that's a far better way for third-party apps to interact with merchants and with Shopify. And, you know, we took a lot of inspiration from a lot of major platforms, like simple things like when you long press on like, uh, on like, uh, I don't know, uh, an app or something like that on your phone, you get a bunch of actions that you can do. And those are actually universal actions. Any app can do, can, Register, can create yeah. those types of, yeah. And that's actually an extension framework. It's like a way that, uh, Apple uh, or an Android have, have have created a framework that apps can register to to fulfill these actions when people do these standardized things, and so like that is just a far more powerful, fast, and also safe platform because now the platform knows what's happening real time, right? It knows when there's like uh, an error in the response. It can like handle that gracefully. It can do all these types of things. So it's just like a huge level up. Now, okay, that sounds all great. You and I both know that that took years and years and years. It's still happening. It's still happening like this is is a very tricky problem because uh, the more sp specific you make those interactions like that exact case i just said the fake one with the uh, the description thing like those are sort of domain specific solutions to it right that's like a pattern that will be useful for that product description context and how many different contexts are there in in a business and commerce like thousands so now you have to figure out what like the general part of the framework is how a develop like is shopify always responsible for figuring out how an extension works on every page or is that actually part of the third party ecosystem too where like we make a very base layer extension framework and then they have to figure out what's specific for that page and then we have to deal with so there's this interesting sort of like spectrum of control that we ended up 
um, uh, always thinking about and in intention around. And, and so the, the spectrum is sort of like Shopify controls everything. And the best, the, the positives of that are that it's super fast. It is always very trustworthy and safe. Uh, and it works across all devices, et cetera. The other side is like, we have no idea what's going on, but third parties have unlimited flexibility to do whatever the hell they want. And the value of that is that everything that can get built will get built. And those are actually, that's merchant value too, right? That's what the merchants want at the end. But they also want things to be safe and fast. So we always had to figure out for every area where on that spectrum is appropriate. And it's not the same everywhere. There are certain areas where like you're dealing with money, sensitive customer data, whatever it may be, that it just needs to be safer. There's areas where like, okay, you know, let them have unlimited powers to like, put snowflakes on a website, this actually happens, uh, or whatever, right? Like those are lower risk areas. Uh, and so give the greater creative canvas to developers. So these are the principles and frameworks we started to develop over time. And we even had groups that were working on like literally called trust, which is like, how do you develop tr three-way trust? Three-way being the merchant trusts, the apps and Shopify. Uh, Shopify trusts the developers and the developers and the developers trust Shopify enough to do business on it. Right. And so like that three way trust and balancing all those things became like kind of mission critical. Um, it never really stopped, really. And that bled its way into, you know, the economics between the companies, the data policy, all these types of things started to, to really um, emerge. And it was like such a it was such a fascinating time, really, to build it all. That's awesome. I was wondering if you could touch a little bit on, you know, I was thinking about the supply side and how do you, how do you get more developers more engaged in Shopify's ecosystem? I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about like developer experience, like how did Shopify think about things like the shape of the actual APIs, developer documentation, how third-party developers would engage with Shopify? Yeah, I, you know, we drew inspiration from some of the best developer products out there. I mean, like, you know, Stripe's always had an amazing developer reputation, documentation, and, we started to actually like before it was pretty wild west like our documentation wasn't even you know on a consistent site uh they're depending on what part of the shop file you're working it could have been like that team had launched something on some other random site that's like using some new you know some new front end tech to display it really nicely but it's like incongruent with the rest of, of shopify and not consistent and then there's the other side of the developer experience which is um, uh, all about like understanding what the hell Shopify's platform actually is and how to actually create value on it and, and, and capture value. So those are like two broad sides of it. So one is like the pure developer experience. How do you get them up and running really quickly? How do you position Shopify and present it as a highly technical platform with real engineers and real support behind it? Um, you know, so we always talked about like, you know, how do we get them into some mock console really early, playing around, just making some mock calls to the API so they can just see, like, these are the things, like, developers like to play with stuff and see it, right? See that it actually works and that they don't have to, like, register for 10,000 different API keys and blah, blah, blah before they can even just see, like, what an order uh, like a, a, an order API level, return so, looks. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Just show me that, right? Uh, and then there's the other spectrum of like, okay, how many different like languages does our API docs uh, support? Like, we we're a very Ruby centric company, and it was basically that for a very long time. And we had to do a lot of work on the developer docs to, you know, make it approachable across the suite of languages that everyone was using. Um, and and so, you know, there was a huge overhaul on on that front. We did a ton of things there, um, and then also like even deeper in like past documentation, just like the ways that an app got provisioned inside of of the developer dashboard, um, them understanding the status of their app when they try to submit it getting back like actual reasonable notes from our our app approval team who also needed to like up level their their technical knowledge so that they could like really support them through those things like it was a full gamut all the way through of a, like a bit of a culture change um, and, and also just like a higher bar on developer experience I say culture change because even though Shopify itself was very uh, like highly technical, tons of great engineers in it. 
it was always an internal uh, sort of culture towards like shipping what is almost the opposite a very simple non-technical product to the to the merchant and this had to and it was actually really exciting i think for the engineering organization which is like oh no no we actually now need to like we had to ship best in product in class developer stuff. And like that got people pretty excited, but it was also a new muscle to flex because I think people have a lot of different opinions on what that needs to be. And it's just hard to find, you know, really good people uh, to, to, to focus on that. And so, yeah, so that, that was one really big aspect of it. Um, there was also like, um, better design like in the api itself around you know access to data we made a huge push to like make everything uh in graphql as well because it was just like what we found was just a much better api surface uh area for for the types of calls and the types of the types of interactions that you do with shopify's back end uh that was massive because we were like probably the second large company to do that I yeah, think like Facebook the first... kind of pioneered it, but uh, yeah. yeah, like commerce is a graph basically, right? Like products exactly. and, and orders and variants and like just this tapestry of different objects and connections. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like uh, historically, you know, if you were to call, um, let's say the last 30 days of orders or something like that, you get like an insanely large payload back of like 99% of data that you don't need, which is just bad for your experience as a developer consuming that data, but also bad for the platform having to like give out that data and like it's really inefficient and et cetera. Whereas GraphQL is much more precise. Like, you know, I can give me like the only the variance for these particular products or, or, or the the, or, the orders that are relevant for them in the blog. So you can make more like just like a precise call of exactly what you need. And, um, and so we went through that huge effort of like both with an in, a huge internal battle to get everyone up there. Like first, we had to make it so that our internal uh, products started using that API, and then like people would only ship a REST API, and they wouldn't ship the GraphQL version of it, or they wouldn't even know that they had to. And we had to sort of be like internal police on that. <laughs> and then there's the documentation, and then we had to deal with the the external aspect, which is like holy shit, Shopify, we are no, like we are changing uh, to the developer ecosystem. We are changing our API to GraphQL. On launch day, we're at par, and we had this internal problem of, okay, wait, how are we actually going to get everyone to switch? Like, it's a huge refactoring cost for a developer and an app to actually switch to this different paradigm. How do we actually do that? And a very tricky problem. Um, we basically ended up, you know, making the strategic kind of long-term decision that over time we're going to launch at parity, and over time. Uh, GraphQL will have a superset of features relative to REST, and it's we're, so we're gonna we're gonna get them to switch based on the carrot, not on the stick. We're not gonna say like we're deprecating REST and you have to do it. Um, you know, we, we decided to to put our best foot forward and, and show them why it's better. Um, so anyway, so like these types of decisions, like no one ever had conversations like those before. So this is like this is what it meant to be developer focused um, and, and and to really change that culture. The the two parts I love in that, one of them is like kind of time to value for the developer, right? It, it's it's the same as with any other product. It's like how can I get my consumer, in this case, the developer, really productive really quickly, right? So you know, lots of code examples in multiple languages, not just Ruby, uh, getting them making API calls as quickly as possible. The second part I love was dog fooding. It sounds like there was a lot of internal use of, of the GraphQL API so that Shopify's own developers could, you know, start to see if there's any rough edges and kind of hammer those out before it goes to a wider ecosystem. There was even a low level lower too, which was there was definitely teams that never even shipped an API. Right. And so like we even had to have an internal transformation to say like, like you, like, you know, feature team X working on some new domain concept in Shopify, it is unacceptable for you to just launch, like, you know, have that all like hidden in the models and then just launch some feature, right? Actually, you need to architect your your feature so that it is consuming itself like our own platform. So you have to like build a core data model, expose that through an API, then you build your app and feature on top of that and consume your own APIs. Like this was a huge change that our, didn't, our team didn't lead it, but we were obviously like at the epicenter of a lot of it. Um, this really, you know, Jean-Michel, our, our, our CTO at the time was like, you know, he was banging on the table literally 10 times a day on this thing. And that was a big, just huge transformation, I think, for the company to 
to become a platform company really in an engineering sense, le- less so in like a, you know, application development or, or product sense. Um, I want to talk a little bit in our final minutes here, just about like, you know, as you, as you think about scaling all those different product teams over the years, any kind of patterns that you, or, or takeaways that you have around, like, what's the difference between a, a good and, you know, I don't know, bad, but dysfunctional product team. Like what are, what are some different management structures, different, uh, techniques you thought about to help improve teams that were low performing or any highlights that, you know, kind of contrasted good versus bad product teams? Yeah, I'd say, you know, it's never, I think it's never a reflection on the people. It's much more a reflection on the conditions that a team is under, uh, and successful conditions and, and less successful ones. I think like there's a lot of basic things there. I think first and foremost, clear definition of like what needs to exist at the end sort of exit criteria uh, and and putting a timeline on it. Like, it's really hard. I like This was one of the hardest things that I just knew to be true, but it's always a battle um, to get through to the organization is like decoupling timeline from that feeling of like, you know, uh, uh, burnout marches and sort of... Um, uh, like unreasonable expectations and, and not respecting the emergent complexity of software, which I had a deep intuition of and respect. It's rather using timelines as a psychological um, uh, for, uh, condition that creates the best types of decision making and efficient use of, of team effort. And when you know like you need something to shift then you make trade-offs. And when you know the exit criteria and like the value that you need, the original problem that you're solving for the, for the merchant or whomever or the developer, like you'll make those trade-offs the right way. But without the time component in there, you're not going to make that trade-off, right? You're, you need actually all of those things together in order to be a high performing team. And so, you know, I'd say those are like very, very baseline conditions. You got to have clear understanding of the problem, clear understanding of exit criteria for success of this thing, and then a timeline. Um, you know, when teams had that, and then they had, and then, sorry, there's one more thing you need. You need someone on the team at least that cares about that, right? There's some. There needs to be some accountability to the team if that isn't met. That doesn't mean like people get yelled at if they don't hit the timeline. It's that like people know that like everyone else thinks that it's shipping then and that this is what it means to be part of a team. And so like the accountability, like taking it seriously that we're trying to actually hit that thing like that. And that comes from individuals inside the team that can come sometimes from external pressure from, you know, your boss's boss's pressure, whatever it may be. Um, sometimes all three, uh, but you do need some accountability in the system for that. And, you know, my preference was always like create the accountability. Like culture is basically my favorite saying on culture is just like culture is the sum of what you punish and what you reward. And, and so like my preference has always been like get people to care about timelines by really celebrating the teams, not that hit the timeline, but that like use the timeline uh, effectively and like made trade-offs. It's not about celebrating, oh, they worked nine, you know, 20 hours a day for six weeks and they shipped it. It's rather like, hey, this is a really hard thing. We ran into these issues. This team still figured out how to ship by doing, making these smart decisions, right? Or they actually used the, the, the difficulty of the timeline to innovate on the way that they solved the thing. And like that, that is like something, if you can celebrate those types of stories and the decisions that go into it, um, I think people have a little bit more, um, a a little less resentment towards those timelines and, and use it and think of it more as like, oh, this is actually just like good discipline for us to, to create a good creative environment. Yeah. Um, it sounds like more carrot and less stick. Yeah. 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 Um, and then the other thing I'd say, okay, so that's like, you know, basic structure and then just on team composition, you know, less is more like, I think I learned over time, like if that, if a project team has more than like three or four engineers, some like challenge that <laughs> it's just hard. There's a huge, there's just a huge coordination burden, even at four. Like, I think that it's a lot like my favorite team is like two engineers and one designer. 
like wow. if you can keep those nuclear kind super of like scrappy. units that yeah super scrappy now that doesn't mean like okay obviously they're not going to do like a you know replatforming or re like complete you know massive massive thing but uh right sizing those teams keeping them slim and let the, letting them letting them grow as the need requires and as like the complexity emerges and it's clear how to like separate concerns and and at least have the team still have clear agency and and clarity on like what part that they have to deliver like that's cool like teams can emerge and grow to those sizes but to say like mm, this feels like a big project probably need 20 people start like that happens a lot actually yeah and i think, I think that that yeah. I, yeah. say, I think it punctured every like vp of engineering ever because i think that's how most projects at big companies are like yeah i'm gonna need like a 20 is even concerned like i need like a hundred developers for this new initiatives we have and they get to grow their org but uh and you like, know what they might they might be right in the end Mm -hmm. But the thing is, the first six months that those 100 people join the project, they're going to be doing nothing. You have to learn why you need 100 people. Right? And, and so, like, it, this isn't, like, you know, a hard rule, but I just found, like, I would always, like, push teams to just be smaller and just see what you can do in a week. Just, like, go prototype, think of no constraints, et cetera. And, like, from that exercise as a small team, which is faster because you're small, we are gonna like double, triple efficiency on yeah. like the next, the next you know few iterations. Yeah, I think that's a good a good model because it also those initial people become your seeds or your anchors, right? To like spread culture, spread context. But yeah, in the beginning, you just have this diffusion of like a focus, I guess. Like, there's no mm -hmm. clear direction the team should be working in. Totally. And uh, yeah, and then figuring that how to like make that part of like your organizational cadence. Like we started to use the term like technical spiking a lot and like even design spiking on areas. And before we even saw a project brief or talked about whether we should do something, like we often had teams do that for like a week or two and just like go play with it, you know, see what you can do. And there were some cases there were some cases where they're like, oh, this is actually like we can actually like ship this next week. That definitely happened. And it would have been otherwise like weeks of meetings and figuring out who's the best person for this team and like talking to their managers and pulling people off of other projects and blah, blah, blah. Like the organizational tax is exponential. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, it's, it's alarming. Even actually at Ops Level, like we have uh, some folks on our team where I'm just amazed. Like you give them a problem and, and like two days and they'll pull something out. And it's just like, wow, that, that's incredible. The level of agency and ownership that comes from that. Amazing. And people love it. It's actually like yeah. the biggest win-win. Like the employees love it too. It's, 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 it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, listen, Brandon, before we wrap up, I, I always like to ask guests, like, what is your favorite music to listen to when you're, you know, uh, wanting to have some focus? Oh, Scott, I just, I should probably get this answer. Like a lot of it's just like low fi beats. If I want focus is just, is always the best. Um, other than that, I like listening to like hip hop or some like really old nineties rock type stuff. Like, um, yeah, that's, that's basically what I jam to. Although with the kids now I'm doing a lot of like Coco melon, and <laughs> baby shark, <laughs> baby shark, blippy type stuff, which is uh, its own, its own other world, but um, it's like a whole yeah. octave higher. Totally. Um, um, cool. Well, and what's the best way for people to follow you on social media? Um, on Twitter, I guess. Uh, so okay. at Brandon M. Chu, uh, all just one string is uh, is probably the easiest way to do it. Actually, I never even got to finish my Shopify story. So then two years ago, I was doing that, and then I switched jobs, and now I do this thing called product acceleration, which we do like uh, acquisitions and investments on uh, behalf of the company. So it was like a it's like a very different type of job. I love doing angel investing uh, on the side as well. Um, I have done like about seventy different individual investments actually over the last like five years, and so that's a big part of it now. And I really enjoy um, just observing, watching entrepreneurs, and seeing all these patterns emerge. Um, over and over again yeah cool actually if i can borrow you for one more minute maybe even though we're yeah, in the yeah, outro, yeah. Uh, for sure any we asked i asked earlier about like patterns between product teams but any patterns among like founders or leaders that you've seen yeah i mean like at the very earliest stages you know there's a big separation i find with like people who who just like want to be a company and be a be eventually a big company, which is a good ambition, but like that, 
they're so compelled by that end state that they start doing big company stuff way too early. And that could be like, you know, we're going to have planning offsites when there's six people. I mean, it's fine to, sorry, it's fine to like go chill and have a retreat, but just go chill. Like, and you don't need to have like some big, like, you know, orchestration around, around planning and strategy and blah, blah, blah. Cause like it's so fast and chaotic at the startup level. It should be almost like a real time conversation. Uh, and then another habit I find of, of those folks is like they, they hire their first PM way too fast. Uh, because you know, it does get really crazy and burdensome as a founder, like work, working on the backlog on like day to day shipping and stuff like that. And you, you, you think you need this thing called a PM because you know that that's kind of what they do on teams. But what you, what people fail to recognize is like the other part of what, oh, the reason why most good PMs are PMs is because they want to lead like product vision and strategy for an area. And when you're a startup, like there's only, you only can make like one or two bets at a time. You as the founder are never, and you should not give that to yeah. someone else. You can't. So yeah. really you end up hiring this PM, they come in, they're like overqualified or like have this sense of agency or belief in agency that you're not really willing to give them. And you may like think you're willing to give it to them, but both you shouldn't and you won't be able to as soon as like they make a decision with 80% of your R and D team, which is like five people, uh, <laughs> uh, about going to this one thing when your intuition says, go do this other thing, hundred percent, you're stopping them. And so, you know, don't kid yourself is what I mean. Like what I always say to those founders is like, Hey, identify, you know, uh, the strongest engineer on the team, uh, at least from like someone who like likes to, uh, be organized and keep the team moving and stuff like that. And like have them run it, have them run the backlog. Yeah. Okay. There'll be things and decisions that they'll have to learn, but like, this is very learnable stuff. And, uh, you know, that also helps them develop. So you're actually building, you know, better folks inside of your company and people want that growth in, in responsibility. They absolutely want those experiences. So do that until that breaks. And that actually lasts forever. Like at Shopify that literally lasted to like 500 people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, on the side that like of people that are just successful, it's just like, well, t two things I've reflected on is like, it's definitely, you know, the people that just sell and build, that's an old cliche, uh, I guess in the startup world, but it's true. It's just like, if they do nothing else but that, like the more time they get hear no and get like slapped in the face by customers, uh, figuratively, uh, the faster they learn and you know, the less fearful they are of, of making mistakes and you got to make a lot of mistakes. I'm sure at ops level in the first couple of years, you guys, you know, went to a bunch of different places that if you could do it all over again, you wouldn't have. Um, but the, this fact that you did it with speed and sort of like, I remember when you guys were just starting out, like you guys were pitching customers even before you fundraised, like even, but like you guys, like from day one. And that was the foundation I think of, of the success that you had to date. And, um, uh, and then the other thing is like product market fit it slaps you in the face. Like people always wonder, do I have it? Do I have it? It's like when you actually have it, it pulls you like you don't, you don't, there's no question about it. Right. So you'll know when you have it. And if you don't know, you don't have it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love the, uh, the anecdote about like getting used to, to know, like I think when I, before I was a founder, like, you know, no is like the scary thing. And I think it's part of just our society. It's like people don't want to be impolite and, you know, being told no is this negative thing. Uh, but yeah, you like anything else you develop almost an immunity to it. It's like, okay, like this customer said, yes, this customer said, no, we move on. Like, yeah. Try them again next time. Um, and it's exactly. part of part of sales and part of life. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, listen, Brandon, again, um, everybody, you know, please feel free to follow Brandon uh, on Twitter. We're going to be putting uh, your the link to your uh, Twitter bio in the show description. Um, we'll include all the info there. It has been absolutely great, Brandon, having you on. And just I super appreciate the time uh, that you gave to, to everyone here today uh, and joining us. Amazing. Thanks, Ken. I had a lot of fun. Yeah. So to all of our listeners, thank you again for making it uh, with us to the end of the episode. If you have any topics or guests you'd like to see on the show, please send us an email at levelup at opslevel.com. And we'll see everybody next time. Happy building. Bye.